Are you worried about 5G technology? Are you wrapped in a space blanket, terrified cell phones are giving you radiation poisoning? This video will explain everything there is to know about 5G, cell phone radiation, and any associated health hazards. Let's start with what 5G technology actually is. 5G refers to a band of electromagnetic radiation used for cell phone communication. Electromagnetic radiation, even though it sounds scary, is just a technical word for what is more commonly referred to as light. So what we're really asking here is what is light? Well, light is a particle called a photon. Wait, I thought light was a propagating electromagnetic wave. Actually, no. Light is made of particles called photons. Now, due to a strange quantum mechanical property, the probability of detecting a photon oscillates in a wave-like fashion. And the frequency of this oscillation is equal to the photon's energy, which is more commonly referred to as its color. The brightness of the light, measured in watts or energy per second, can be found by simply counting the number of photons per second and then multiplying by the energy or the frequency of those photons. So then why are we always told that light is a wave? Well, even though light is a stream of particles, if there are a lot of them, like so many that you can no longer resolve the individual photons, because of this funny business of oscillating probability, it looks just like a wave. So the wave model is a coarse grained picture of light that works really well in most applications, but it's technically wrong, and in actuality, light is a stream of particles. I cannot stress this fact enough, as it will be very important later on when determining the safety of electromagnetic radiation. Now that we know what light is, we can map it according to frequency, i.e. energy, in the following way. On the far left here, we have the highest energy photons, which are called gamma rays. As we move to the right, to lower energy, we pass X-rays and then ultraviolet, and just past ultraviolet light, there is a narrow band of frequencies that can be detected by the human eye, which we call visible light. On the high end of this narrow band is violet light, and on the low energy end is red light. If we go to lower energy still, we get into a band called infrared, which our eyes can no longer see, but we can feel it as heat. Continuing to lower energy, we reach microwave frequencies and then very low energy light is called radio waves. But remember, it's not really a wave. Frequencies used by cell phones lie about here. And 5G technology is no different. It just extends the frequency band to the left, giving us a wider bandwidth which allows for faster bit rates. So now the big question. Is electromagnetic radiation dangerous? Well... This is the same as asking if photons are dangerous, or if light is dangerous. Let's go back to our diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum. We know that all photons with energies in the UV or above are harmful. This is called ionizing radiation, because the photons have enough energy to break up atomic bonds. And if too much of this happens in your body, it will damage your DNA, and you may get some form of radiation poisoning, such as cancer. Just below UV, we have visible light, followed by infrared or heat. I think we can all agree that these bands are perfectly safe as we are constantly bathed in them. Yes, it's true, too much heat can burn you, but that's a separate issue and we'll get into that later. Below infrared, the photons have even less energy, so any harm these photons might cause must be less than any harm caused by visible light or body heat. So we can conclude they must be safe. And since cell phone frequencies lie in this range, they too must be safe. Wait a minute. Yes, it's true, the individual photons have less energy, but couldn't you just accumulate more of them over time and eventually have a very large amount of energy? And wouldn't that be dangerous? Well, this is where the distinction between wave and particle is important. Imagine you want to break a window, and you have a million Nerf balls. The Nerf balls are soft and lightweight, i.e., each individual ball carries very little energy. You could throw as many of them at the window as you want, and the window will never break because no individual Nerf ball has enough energy to break the bonds holding the glass together. If, on the other hand, you throw a single baseball at the window, the baseball is hard and heavy, 
i.e. it packs a lot of energy, and can easily break through the glass. Even if the total energy of the million Nerf balls greatly supersedes that of the one baseball, no individual Nerf ball can ever break through the glass. So we see that in order to break the window, what matters is energy per ball, not total accumulated energy. And this is the situation we have with electromagnetic radiation. But this is only true because light is a particle. If it were a wave, however, then the continuous flow of energy would make it possible to accumulate low energy waves over time until you eventually punch through the window. But light is not a wave, so non-ionizing photons cannot break atoms apart, no matter how many you shine on them. If you're still not convinced, we can ignore this energy per photon argument altogether and just look at the total energy emitted by cell phones. Here we have a plot of power emitted versus frequency, or in other words, number of photons per second versus the energy of those photons. Your cell phone will look like one of these pink spikes. It's gonna depend on the carrier and the cell phone you have, Different cell phones have different power capabilities, but typically they operate between 1 and 3 watts. You can check the specs on your battery. Your cell phone cannot emit more power than the battery can provide. Now way over here, for reference, we have ionizing frequencies. Let's now compare the power emitted by your cell phone to other radiation sources. A person standing in the sun will receive this amount of radiation. We can see here that some of that light is in the UV, which is ionizing, and that's why you need to wear sunscreen. In blue, we have the power spectrum of a 50 watt light bulb. We see it's the same spectrum as the sun, but lower power, i.e. less photons of the same color. The radiation emanating from the human body has a power spectrum in the infrared that looks like this. The total power emitted by your phone, we said, was about two watts. Compare that to the 1800 watts you'll receive if you're out in the sun. Obviously, a 50 watt light bulb will emit 50 watts, and the human body radiates about 1000 watts. As we can see, not only do the sun, light bulbs, and the human body radiate at higher frequencies than your cell phone, that is, each photon has more energy, but they also radiate at higher power, meaning that the total energy or the total number of photons is higher. So if cell phones worry you, you should be terrified of these other sources. How about cell phone towers? They're everywhere and constantly bombarding us with radiation, aren't they? Well, cell phone towers operate somewhere between 10 and 100 watts, which is basically the same as a light bulb in your house. The FCC limits how much power a tower can operate at. But the thing is, as you move away from the source, the power is spread out over a larger area, and so the intensity drops as one over the distance squared. Say a typical tower is about 100 feet tall. Then the closest you can get to the source is if you're standing right at the base of the tower. If you work out the math, this means that the max radiation a person could receive from a single tower is about 1 one hundredth of a watt. And that's if the tower is operating at the max of 100 watts and you're standing right below it. But in general, you're not right below it and the tower operates closer to about 10 or 20 watts. Sparing you the details of the calculation, on average, I estimate that you're receiving about a billionth of a watt from cell phone towers at any given time. Clearly, your phone, despite being a weak source of only 2 watts, is the dominant source of exposure to radiation due to cell phone technology. How about microwave ovens? They cook your food using microwave radiation, so doesn't that prove microwave radiation is dangerous? And what frequency do they use to cook your food anyway? Well, if we go back to our diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum, here we have cell phone frequencies, including 5G, and microwave ovens typically operate right about here. Oh my god, cell phones are literally cooking our brains alive. Well, just hold on a second before busting out that space blanket. You can just as easily cook your food using radiation from fire. This is where too much heat, despite it being non-ionizing, can actually harm you. So what does it mean to actually heat something up? It just means that you're causing all the molecules to shake a little bit. And to cook your food, you need a lot of radiation to shake the compounds so much that they end up breaking down. And a household microwave typically operates at around 1000 watts or more. Remember, your cell phone emits about 2 watts. So just as radiation from a fire can cook your food, or burn your flesh, if you decrease your exposure, say by standing back a bit, it's no longer strong enough to do any damage. 
If anything, it feels rather nice. To give you an idea, your hand alone radiates about 7 watts. So while you're talking on your phone, you're getting about twice as much radiation just from your hand as you are from your phone. Now it's true that the infrared radiation from your hand does not penetrate very deep into your skin, while the microwaves from your phone can penetrate deeper and actually reach your brain. But if you're worried about your cell phone giving you brain cancer, then you should also be worried about the heat from your hand giving you skin cancer. Still, how much radiation does your brain actually receive? We can use the results from this study looking at the penetration depth of microwaves through human flesh to make an estimate. If your cell phone is up against your ear, half of that radiation is emitted away from you and half towards you. In the paper, they found that for radiation directed straight at you, which would be the case if your phone is right up against your ear, about 40% of it is reflected back. So we're left with 60% of the half of the photons that were emitted towards you actually penetrating. But before getting to your brain, the photons must first pass through your scalp and your skull. We can use the measured penetration depth for a 10 GHz signal, which would be in the 5G band, to find that about 90% of the photons will be absorbed prior to making it to your brain. After that, your brain will absorb pretty much all of what's left. So the total amount of radiation absorbed by your brain will be the initial power emitted by your phone, times the half that's directed towards you, times the 60% that's not initially reflected by your skin, times the 10% that makes it through your scalp and your skull. This amounts to about 3% of the total power rated by your phone, which we said was about 2 watts, giving a total of about 60 milliwatts reaching your brain. To give you an idea of how little this is, if your brain was permanently bathed with this radiation, its equilibrium temperature would increase by about 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit, or 0.05 degrees Celsius. And that's assuming your body has no mechanism for adjusting its temperature, which it does. Seriously, it's nothing to worry about. Your body easily deals with much stronger sources of extra heat all the time, like exercising or wearing clothes. Now, all these arguments and calculations are very nice, but the true test is to see what experiments find. Has the incidence of radiation-related illnesses increase with cell phone use? Well, the studies, unfortunately, are pretty much all over the map. So what do we make of this? Generally, when this happens, it's a sign that whatever signal you're trying to extract from your data is too weak, and you're just measuring random noise. The best thing to do in this case is to limit yourself to large-scale studies and meta-analyses that combine multiple studies. By the way, all the links to the studies in this video can be found in the description. Okay, so what do these large-scale studies find? Well, they too are kind of all over the map, but they're heavily weighted on the no-danger side. Wait a minute. After all this, there are studies that find health risks associated with cell phone radiation? Well, yes, but they are by far in the minority, and if you take a look at them, their conclusions say things like possible evidence or adequate evidence to suggest a link, or seems to be associated with greater odds. This is hardly the language of certainty. On the other hand, the overwhelming majority of large-scale studies find no evidence or link between cell phone use and tumors or other radiation-related illnesses, such as the much-publicized and international interphone study, or this review of general health conditions and cell phone radiation, or this study, or this one, or this one, or this one that also found evidence of publication bias in favor of papers finding links, meaning the studies that did find negative effects, despite already being in the minority, are overrepresented in the literature. We also have this study looking at the effects on children. There are many more, and I can't include them all, but if you're really concerned, I encourage you to search through the peer review literature yourself. Finally, here is data comparing cell phone use over time to the incidence of brain cancer. We can see that despite the heavy increase in cell phone use, there is no change in the rate of brain tumors. We can now firmly conclude that radiation from your cell phone is perfectly safe and 5G is no different, it's just a broader range of frequencies. So if you've been living like this, desperately clinging to that space blanket, just remember, you should truly be terrified of these much more common, much higher energy, and much more powerful sources of electromagnetic radiation. Of course you're not, 
as you know that these are of no danger, just put a little sunscreen on for that UV radiation and rest assured that your cell phone is perfectly safe. Well, maybe not entirely.